This is no ordinary ship. I'm standing on the bow of what's soon to be the world's largest electric ferry. It's being built here in this shipyard in Hobart, Tasmania. A long way from its final destination in South America, the ferry will travel between Argentina's capital, Buenos Aires, to Colonia del Sacramento, Uruguay, carrying 2,100 passengers and 225 cars. It'll transport commuters 30 nautical miles, or about 55 kilometres, across the River Plate three times a day. To make the hour-long journey, it's going to need some serious batteries. There's over 5,000 battery modules that weigh 280 tonnes. That's the equivalent of about 860 average size electric vehicle batteries. Can we go in and have a look? Yep, certainly All can. Right, after okay. you. No worries, thank you. That's me. I travelled to the INCAT headquarters in Tasmania, Australia, to go behind the scenes, to check out how the batteries will work. Standing in the battery room. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to power the world's biggest electric ship. The construction and the challenges this company is going to have to overcome to build the world's biggest electric ferry. On charging, how big of a problem into the future is that for the future that you want to build more? Absolutely. I think, Jess, that's it's probably the biggest constraint across the industry. How important is it for you to be part of that new wave of innovation? First of all, we can't sell diesel-powered ships anymore. We haven't got a lot of choice. We have to get into the, uh, into the new technology. Batteries are getting better all the time. Systems are getting better. Electric motors are getting better. What we're building now is today's technology. There's not the slightest doubt that in two or three years' time it'll be even better. And, uh, two or three times a day. And, <laughs> it's a noisy work site. Uh, it's a noisy work site. It's a real work site. Um... So how do you build a battery big enough for a ship like this? Does it change the design? How do you even charge this thing? What can it mean for the future of travel? And can batteries be the answer to the shipping industry's reliance on fossil fuels? All right, should we see what all this noise is about? What, what you guys are doing? And now behold the crowning triumph of transport. Over the centuries, ferries have evolved from using paddles to steam engines, to burning harmful fossil fuels like diesel and gas. Can the humble ferry go all electric? You may be wondering how a tiny island at the end of the world came to be at the forefront of electric ship innovation. It's all got to do with Robert Clifford. That's the boat we're building right now. A pioneering shipbuilder. His ferries first came to fame in 1975, when Hobart's bridge collapsed. A complete span was ripped out of the bridge by the 11,000 tonne freighter Lake Illawarra, now lying at the bottom of the River Derwent. We had two small ferries in operation and we quickly built uh, three more ferries. So we were able to carry nine million people through that period when the bridge was down. But when the bridge was restored, we effectively had to find a new business. And he's been pushing the boundaries on fast, lightweight ferries ever since. We're one of the leading shipbuilders in the world with lightweight construction. And lightweight construction and electricity go together because less power is needed. Not only less power, but most importantly, less charging time when the ships are in port. And how big of a risk is it to go all in on the fully electric ship? Uh, I don't see it as a risk at all. The risk would be that if we tried to stay with uh, fossil powered fuels, we would run out of the market. That's the big risk. When the people see this particular next ship on the water, they will be basically shocked by the size of it and the capability of the ship. We're looking at INCAT's Hull 96, which is going to be the world's largest electric ferry. When Hull 96 was first commissioned, it was designed to be powered by another fossil fuel, gas. The design had been done and the engines ordered. But then the pandemic hit, putting a pause on construction and a change of heart from INCAT's South America customer, Booker Bus, who decided they wanted an electric ship. How hard was it to change the design to battery electric at that point? Is it much of a change in the actual boat? It's, it's a really significant change in the, in the systems within the boat. The, the structure itself, reasonably similar, but the actual systems in the boat, so the energy systems, the propulsion systems, the control systems, entirely different. So it was a significant redesign. You might be wondering how the weight of a battery for this ship compares to a diesel engine. Compared to a di traditional diesel engine with fuel tanks, it's slightly lighter. 
So, so we're actually saving weight. I'm surprised, I think most people will be surprised that the electric batteries are lighter than the diesel engine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Batteries are heavy pieces of equipment, but, but think of eight diesel engines and all the fuel tanks we need to, to power those, compared to the, the batteries themselves, which are charged from the shore side every time the, the boat docks. Stepping on to the new electric ferry pier, one of the really important things is the weight. INCAT is known for its lightweight ferries. Is that a bit of a secret formula that you guys hold? Ab absolutely, INCAT's renowned for its, its weight management, so our ability to build lightweight ships and really manage that weight so it's always lower. And other companies have tried to emulate it and not succeeded? I think other companies would are desperate to find out how we do it, but uh, that's why we protect it so much and it's really important to our customers. And all of that cabinetry you do in-house? It's all done here in-house. Yeah. does the weight of that also, that's all taken into account? Every kilogram is measured, yeah. So we, again, we use the lightest weight materials possible that are, that are safe, that are fireproof. Um, and we, we measure all of that weight. Everything's weighed before we put it onto the vessel so we know exactly where we stand. While INCAP prides itself on doing most of the work here in Tassie, the batteries are coming from Norway. Although they haven't quite arrived. Can we go in and have a look? Yep, certainly All can. Right, after okay. you. No worries, thank you. So we've got two complete separate battery rooms on each side. So there's going to be about a thousand batteries in this yeah, room? Yeah, a bit over a thousand batteries wow. in this one room. <laughs> and obviously four rooms that we've got in total. What we're standing on at the moment is the bases. So with this configuration of batteries, there's a, there's a base on the bottom and then the batteries stack together all the way up pretty much to the roof. And has this battery technology been used anywhere else? The technology itself has been, but the, the style of this battery, so the mechanical configuration of the battery hasn't been used before. So typically the, the batteries, each individual battery will go into a, a little stacking module, um, like a little rack or a little drawer. But this is the first one that I'm aware of where they actually, the modules actually go together. And what's the advantage of that? Uh, particularly for us, they're lightweight, they're more compact um, and more efficient in, in the space that you've got to use to utilise for them. The ceiling at the moment, when it's finished, it'll be a glass atrium ceiling. Then there's the charging infrastructure. A critical reason this world first electric ferry is being ordered for the River Plate is because ferry company Booker Bus is able to invest in the superfast chargers on both sides of the river, with a full charge taking just 60 to 90 minutes. Talk me through the charging. It is a fast charging system and really, really complicated uh, piece of infrastructure. There will be the same charging mechanism mechanisms on both ends in these ports and the charging has been built around the, the turnaround time of the vessel. Uruguay's electricity is close to 100% renewables, running off hydropower and wind making charging on that side of the river close to zero emissions. Argentina still relies heavily on fossil fuels, with renewable power making up around 30% of its electricity generation. Tasmania is also proudly running off 100% renewable energy, making the emissions of building this ship pretty low too. But this ferry will also need to make the long journey from Tasmania to the River Plate in South America. To do that, it'll have to hitch a ride on a heavy lift ship and will take nearly a month. There's just not many recharge stations across the, across the Pacific Ocean for us. <laughs> Funnily enough. <laughs> and on charging, how big of a problem into the future is that for, your, for the rest of your, you know, for the future that you want to build more? It's probably the biggest constraint across the industry and that's where I think we'll see governments and regulators step in to make sure that there's power supply in ports all around the world. The lack of charging infrastructure is a big hurdle for the shipping industry to overcome in its bid to decarbonise. It's also a problem for INCAT's future customers, who don't have the certainty to go electric. That's why INCAT's next order of ferries are diesel electric hybrids, but with a twist. Probably only five to ten years away where we could do a docking and actually take out the, the, the diesel engine components and replace it with more batteries so that they get to 100% battery electric. It's pretty amazing that you can do that design with that in mind, you know, to, to, to convert them to fully electric into the future. Yeah, absolutely. It is, again, it's a bit of that INCAD innovation and um, ability to problem solve, but we're, we're designing the ships now and building them now so they're fitted for 100% batteries in the future. The shipping industry is a major contributor of fossil fuel emissions. In 2022, an estimated 858 million tonnes of CO2 came from shipping, 
compared to 739 million tonnes from flying. But most of the emissions come from large cargo ships that burn dirty bunker fuel, with passenger ferries making up just 3% of shipping's overall emissions. And this is a bit of a test case for the shipping industry more broadly. Ferries have quite short distances to go, you know, this one's got one hour each yeah. way. Yep. Do you see a future where this kind of technology can be put onto cargo ships and longer journeys? Yeah, we, we've talked about that as an industry and, and certainly the ferry industry, so the ships that we build here at INCAT, we're focusing on the 100 nautical miles or less and that's, that's typically your, your fast transport ferries that are taking passengers in cars and they're, they're an established part of the transport network like, like through Europe and their islands. The large cargo tankers I think have, have bigger challenges to face and so they're looking at um, renewable fuel sources that they can store on board like ammonia or hydrogen or there's probably an element of battery electric that they could do but very hard for ships that are that large, that heavy because they're steel and with the, the amount of range they have to travel to be 100% battery electric because they're going to need to recharge as they go. The global shipping industry has a goal of reaching net zero emissions by 2050. It's a tough ask for an industry that accounts for 3% of global emissions. But if they can pull this off, it might just be possible. After a slow start, construction on this ferry has been powering ahead. With the exterior completed, and the interior well on its way, it will be ready to hit the water sometime in 2025. In the meantime, INCAT is expanding its operations to meet the growing demand in electric ferries, with the rest of the world watching on in anticipation.